So guys, this is a very special episode. So whether you are watching here on YouTube or you are listening in on the Best Damn Camp podcast, unlike usual, I am not alone. And no, this isn't, I know it's Halloween, it's not a horror film, don't worry, it's not that kind of not alone. No, I am joined by a very special guest who is well, just incredible. I, I'm so shocked that he is here. And let's just get into it and stop my fangirling mess of a beginning here. And I would like to introduce you guys to Salvat Chadder, the upcoming writer for City of the Play God of the Rick Riordan Presents in print. So what thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. Oh well thanks for the invite, Fran. It's like as soon as you tweeted how much you uh, loved the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I knew that we there was a friendship <laughs> in the making. So again, <laughs> thanks for the invite to, for today. It's really nice to actually oh my gosh to be interacting with people. Oh my gosh, seriously, just every so often I, I was literally I went to the opticians today and for some reason going to just getting an eye test was like the highlight of my year. And I was like, this is, is this sad? Yes, it is a little bit sad, but thankfully I'm speaking to Sawat later, so I can feel a little bit better now. But yeah. <laughs> seriously, thank you so much for coming and for coming to talk about City of the Play God and your past writing work and the life of the writer and all things mythology as well, which for anyone who listens in knows that is something I'm very much about, but I stick very niche. So I'm glad to be learning a little bit more about other types of mythology as well, so so, what can you tell people a little bit more about what you've written, uh, who you are, and all these sort of things, just before we dive in? Okay, cool. Oh, what I'll do is I'll start well with the most recent thing. So, <laughs> uh, what's fantastic is I'm in the Rick Ryden Presents imprint, and oh, Rick needs no introduction. But in the last couple of years, he's run an imprint that has been bringing other mythologies to much more into the mainstream, and what's great is their non-western mythologies starting mm. off with indian but there's also been uh america oh, central south america there's recently been west african and i was really really kindly invited to present a muslim protagonist mm. and it was honestly it was one of those emails you absolutely dream about receiving when Rick's editor dropped me line and says, hey, so what, how are you doing? You know, Rick's running this new imprint, you want to take part? And it was basically, I had to, I almost chewed the laptop at that moment <laughs> in my desperation. <laughs> yes, make all the money. <laughs> so Cookie the Play God comes out in January. It's a, um, it's a contemporary setting. It's mm. a, about a American-born Muslim kid, sick, Sikandar Raziz, or Sikh, as he's nicknamed. He lives in New York, and he discovers that the ancient Mesopotamian gods are real, and they are after him. He's of Iraqi heritage, which, for those of you not familiar with ancient history, and why should you be, Mesopotamia was the old name for that er area. And what's, um, what is great fun is... First of all, I was born and raised a Muslim, so I've always been wanting to write a story with a protagonist from my sort of heritage. But um, when you talk about Arabian mythology, you're always ending up with genies and flying carpets, etc. And so I have been pondering doing a Muslim story for so long, but I was looking for a new angle rather than something that, oh, here's another story with a gym, yeah? Which, they're great, but I wanted to do something that nobody else had really dabbled in. And so it seemed really obvious, now in hindsight, it seems really obvious. Mesopotamia, it's the oldest civilization in the world. A lot of the mythologies that we are now familiar with originated from them, yeah? And yeah. what, yeah, so the more I explored it, the more I realised this was the answer to my dreams. I introduced a Muslim character, but his heritage goes back ultimately 5,000 years. That's how old Mesopotamia actually is. And so you've had different cultures that have grown out of it, uh, Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, but they're all part of a single continuum. 
that started mm. 3000 BC and ran on basically till you know uh, the appearance of the Romans and it's great fun because first of all it's something unfamiliar and I love doing research and exploring stuff anyway and I think that's one of the great things about being a writer you can pursue your passions and actually earn a living out of them I mean that's just what's so magical because I'm in London, I'm only down the road from the British Museum, which for better or for worse has an insane amount of Mesopotamian artifacts that are very traveled from the, from the 19th century. And the more you look into it, the more you realize, oh my gosh, there's so much that we now take as part of the Old Testament, part of other mythologies that came out of there originally. So yeah, I was really privileged to be writing for the Rick Ryder Presents line really excited about writing Muslim protagonist and thrilled I had this whole new when I say new new to me but ancient to, to the world mythology to be to be writing about and yeah January it comes out and I'm both terribly excited and terribly anxious oh I'm, I admit it, I'm not surprised that the, the idea of it just it's somewhere I want to be someday. So I am a writer myself and I, I can't wait for the day that happens. But even the small publications that I get now, I'm like, oh my goodness, just there's my name's on something. Just the fear that kind of comes through it alongside the excitement. I, I totally get that. And I'm so thrilled to to get the book when it does come out and read through it. It's, it's a subject that I'm... I am not knowledgeable in myself. So to get something to kind of look into and maybe lead to a further exploration of that mythology and that history is interesting. I've had the same with some of the other imprints as well, like Tristan Strong, for example, for the West African mythology was incredible. And to see more coming out as well. It's uh so it's it's a it's a privilege as a reader as well to kind of see different mythologies. So I'm I'm definitely excited. I'm hoping people watching this are gonna be excited. And if you're not, that you guys should be now. Uh, this is this is a warning from me. <laughs> no, actually, no. I feel like I shouldn't be telling. For <laughs> read the book, guys. Either way, get get the book when it comes out. It's it's going to be epic. It's just do it. But <laughs> before I carry on with borderline threatening of my viewers and listeners, um, let's <laughs> dive in a little bit more with our first question for you, which is. So this is to do with your past predominantly. So you mentioned on, I think it's your author bio page. I can't remember where it was. I found it now and I feel bad that I don't remember where it was. But you mentioned that, that your interest in the gaming world and gaming is kind of what helped pull you into writing. So what was it about gaming and the world of writing that pulled you so much to making that switch from what you were doing before to becoming a full-time writer right. now? Okay, I'm an old school tabletop gamer, yes. And so while I'm a computer gamer, let me make that clear. And so <laughs> for me, and I'm talking about like 1981, 82, yeah. Mm. And computer games at that point were literally the bat and ball that would go up and down the screen, going bing, 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 bing. And so, yeah, <laughs> for about half an hour, but you know, hardly addictive. So yeah. Um and it's amazing how many writers, especially fantasy writers, were playing Dungeons and Dragons when they were kids. And when you, if you play D and D, you know exactly why. There's loads and loads of world. Well, it's essential world building. Now, because it's become so popular and so widespread, there'll be companies um, that would have done the world building for you. But back in the day. You had to do it all yourself. You had a rule book. You had the, um, a few details. But beyond that, it was entirely for you to explore and create. You can still obviously do that. But back in the early days of role play, the huge emphasis was on you creating the setting. And yeah. what's amazing, and it's something that I mentioned, discussed with Francis Harding ages ago, the thing about role playing is... You have the games master, he or she creates the setting, but then you have your players who are sitting around you. And so you're getting an immediate response from them real time. Are they enjoying it? Are they on the edge of the sea? Or are they staring out past you, gazing at the window or whatever, because the story's not engaging? And so week, and you played weekly. So week by week, you were testing your story 
telling skills literally in front of a live audience yeah and yeah. what was also great was because they were your friends you've been playing with week by week you couldn't go for the same old tricks because i said oh yeah so i did that oh the meeting's going to take place tomorrow well that means the character we're meeting is going to be dead and there'll be some sort of clue yeah and so you were constantly having to up your game because they could you know they knew your they knew your little tricks um, um because there would be four or five other players they all had to have equal time you couldn't just say right the story's going to be where the wizard's the hero or the the fighter's going to be the hero they all had to share equal time equal tension equal moments of glory and what's brilliant is that reminds you everyone is a hero in their own story which is something that one tries to bring to one's own writing you might be writing a single point of view but nobody else sees themselves as just the the sidekick or they're just to support the main character mm. they're all taking part in the tale themselves one of the great things about the role playing was that you had to make sure that every character had equal time and that mm. made you realize that each character in your own story was the hero too and so they're not mm. just filling in and they're just to move the plot along for the main character they must have their own agenda and so yeah. role play was really brilliant for that and frankly i think you know from the 80s pretty much through to the time i made the transition into wanting to be a writer i've been playing mm -hmm. so if you go up into the loft i have absolutely shelffuls of stories that i've written and i hadn't realized but now in hindsight i realized i was all training to to write novels mm that's that's fascinating it's something that i've always heard as well just especially with tabletop gaming so i, I only got into it whilst i was at university because um i luckily did a creative writing degree at university and we had wow. a tabletop module so i learned how to create my own tabletop games and stuff like oh, that wow right so so good highly recommend for anyone wow. who wants to do it um and so i'd never experienced tabletop gaming prior to that and going into it you learn so much different things about writing in that format and I'd never play tested or, or been a game master as well so I had to like game master my own game I was like I have no idea what I'm doing but like you could just kind of go through it. and it's like you said you you figure out how to make sure every single person has a role in that story like you may have an idea of how you kind of want it to go, but firstly, as well with players, like someone's going to try and seduce someone, someone's going to yeah. kill a random merchant because they can, and you've got to try and have like <laughs> work things around with that. So it's it's definitely building up your storytelling. So hearing that, I was like, oh yeah, that actually, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the thing. Really, really great point because you may have a plan. For the story mm. doesn't mean the characters are going to stick with it yeah exactly and that's what's also brilliant because it forces you to be able to think on the you know think on the hoof and you think right okay and it again that feeds into the writing that you're not so scared of exploring a, a new idea that should suddenly develop and think well actually that is a completely different direction from where i thought the story was going but that's fresher and more exciting. So I'm going to follow that path instead. And I don't know where it's going to lead, but it's going to lead into an adventure. And so, yeah, that was the and that was the nice thing about the role playing thing. It's something that I'm trying to rediscover in my writing. Mm. I went through a period where I'd meticulously plot the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's pros and cons to that one of the yeah. pros is making sure you save the best till last yeah mm. where you think right it's heading towards a cathartic but cataclysmic climax right and so you can plot the build-up but on the other hand the risk is the reader seeing the path that you're laying out for them yeah, yeah. because you know everyone's read you know people say there's only seven stories in the world so you're the risk is you fall into uh, a pattern that the reader can recognize and therefore anticipate. And then when the climax arrives, they're not surprised because they think, yeah, I saw that coming. Yeah. Mm. So what I'm now trying to do is only look just ahead. Yes. I've got this scene. I can see where the next scene or two is going to be. 
I don't know beyond that. And that's become really, really exciting. And it's actually making mm. me delve into the character much, much more because the, there's that battle between character versus plot that a lot of writers will talk about where the risk becomes the character is merely a piece. You're just moving along the plot path and they don't mm. appear to have any free will because the writers decided they must end reach position X by the end of it. Yeah. But, um, but by only just seeing ahead in your story, the character is therefore making all the decisions and you mm. as a writer can't guess what that decision is going to be. And so, yeah, I'm having a real, yeah, going to that, which is actually something that I learned from our role playing, you know, my role playing mm. friends, where I didn't write the next adventure until I knew where the characters ended up in the previous one. Yeah. And that's fascinating. And hearing kind of like that, it, it sort of kind of goes into this sort of follow up question, which is considering that you're talking about the excitement of kind of going into these different things, there's always brought up this idea that writing is often considered one of the most difficult careers and like the most difficult decisions that you can make in like sometimes it can make you hate reading after a while like oh maybe I would have written it like this and stuff like that there's always complications that come with it and sort of the struggles that writers can face but alongside that it's also one of the most interesting the most fun careers and things that you can do I find and so kind of with that so what would you say for you at least are the main highs and lows of being a writer? Okay, the main highs is the exploration because mm. there comes a point where the character that you've created, which is this strange artifact, you know, artifice, suddenly has a life of their own. Yeah. Mm. And honestly, Fran, I think that's really a magical moment when yeah. you really can see that they've got their own plans and own choices and own sense of where they want to be in the world and that's really really thrilling and it's funny because you have peeked behind the curtain because you mm. create them you remember all the different name changes when you're deciding they should be a bit more like this a bit more like that but there's a, a sort of catalytic moment in a character creation where they really do start feeling like they're living, breathing individuals in themselves. And you're just, right, you're, you're sort of along for the ride, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's, again, this sense that you don't know where you're going to end up with this story. And it's that, for me, is one of the biggest highs. It's that sense of adventure that, as a writer, you're even more in the dark than a reader is in many ways. Because yeah. as a writer... There's a point where you have absolutely no idea what lies ahead. Yeah. You yeah. have no idea it's going to be 300 pages or it's going to be 500 pages, a thousand, or whatever. Yeah. While a reader comes to the story with the story already having been decided, they may, have, they would have read the blurb, they may have gone on to Goodreads, they've got a sense of what it's going mm. to be. But as a writer at the beginning, and even, well, actually, even at times at the end, you still don't quite know. And it's one of those funny things with City of the Plague God. I wrote this in 2018. And the premise is what would happen if a strange, uncurable disease sprang out of nowhere and hit a city? Yeah. And that was 2018. I thought, well, yeah, that seems a little bit far fetched. I wonder how it's going to play out. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, and then 2020 came along. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was amazing was thinking, oh my gosh, there are these things that I've written about that are actually now happening. Yeah. And there are these things that I thought were ridiculous when real life they seem terribly moderate now, right? And what's happening in real life is even more insane. <laughs> um, so and that's what I mean about this exploration element. You just yeah. know, Quite, and you know, Arena's is going to come to it now. You know, pick it up hopefully in January twenty twenty one with all this other baggage. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. And I remember seeing it as well. Seeing the title, I was like, "Well, that's a bit apt for, for what this current environment is." All I can say is to all my listeners and watchers here: if you want to read a proper book that has plague references and not those 
pandemic romances to do with someone falling in love with the coronavirus who is a human form <laughs> this uh, is a book that you want to read <laughs> not that they can't oh, sit here play god <laughs> although part of me marvels at the concept of it i know i didn't know it was a thing i saw it pop up somewhere that it was an there was a book about a woman falling in love with the actual coronavirus and i was like what? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've not mentioned the lows, right? Okay, and this is funny because this is something that I think um, are all writers, no matter where they are in their career, still mm. feel. And yeah. the meaning is, each time you go into a new book, you feel you know nothing. Yeah, you start with that blank page or whatever, thinking, "Oh my gosh, everything I've previously written was a complete sham, a complete fluke." I'm. Mm. I have no idea what I'm doing. This is all complete rubbish. And now everyone's going to realise. And it's funny because I discussed this very briefly. I had a online uh, interview with Kawami, who, of course, has written Tristan Strong. Yeah, mm. and he said exactly yeah. the same thing. In that sense, when you start a new story, you feel you know nothing. And that, I think, remains the low. Um, and I find that really interesting because I prior to becoming a writer I used to be an engineer yeah mm. and each new project I started there was certain you felt you already had a map of what you were going to be doing and I think that's the unique aspect of a creative career versus a craft career for the want of a better word yeah mm. with the craft career there's a clear methodology that you cannot deviate from Within mm. engineering, you cannot say, well, I'm just going to make up anything because the building will then fall down. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, it's, you know, there are rules and there are rules for a reason. But mm. within a creative profession, there are only guidelines. If you feel confident about breaking the rules, then by all means, you should go ahead and, and break them. Yeah. I oh, know, definitely. Um, it, it's something that I think. I know I do. Like I'm, I'm not a professional writer in any form. I, I consider myself a writer, whether I had publications or not. If I write, I'm a writer. That's the whole sort of thing. If you write, you are a writer, and I, I love that sentiment as well. Of like, whether you've published or not, if you write, you are a writer. So I, I love that sentiment. But just from that as well, just in terms of story writing, and I know we touched on this briefly at uh, at the beginning when you were introducing to do with the East City of the Play God. Um, with the story for um, your book coming out what was it in particular that drew you to writing this story and what about it do you hope people will kind of get out from the story as well when right. they read it? simply put muslims being terrorists that's what drew me to the story and okay. so um you know I've been brought up a Muslim, you know, I've been mm. born and brought up in England, but of course we have the Crusades, yes, yeah. and with, you know, thing, things like 9-11, etc., but even prior to that, the amount of times in the media, even as a kid, where the Muslims were the bad guys, right? Mm. And then what ended up, what I found was interesting was in literature or in whatever other sort of media, when there became an exploration of the Muslim character, it was often filled with angst. It fell into, if it was a male character protagonist, it was about him being seduced into terrorism. If it was a female character, it was typically about them being into a forced marriage or oppressed by the men of folk, et cetera. And mm. so there was always a negative aspect to it. Yeah the character, and I thought, right, no, I'm going to write a Muslim protagonist where he's got no hang-ups about it. It's about a celebration of his heritage rather than mm. trying to make an excuse or it's something that he's battling against. And if only he can shed himself of it, he'll be fine. And I yeah. think that is actually was actually the biggest, biggest factor. And that's what was so great about Rick Ryden Presents. It was the freedom to break from the, for the one of a better word, the worthy agenda that is mm. often attached with writing a Muslim protagonist. And I know this from the very beginning, because when I first mm. got into 
writing, and this is back in when I first became published in 2009, there was this anticipation that, well, when are you going to write your Muslim story? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, when I can find a fresh way of doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with Sikh, he's Muslim. He is of Iraqi heritage, but he was born and brought up in Manhattan. He's like 13 years old, but he has no, there's no culture clash with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that I think a lot of people really don't realize in our, amongst our, for me, you know, our children, our modern youth, the world is so whether you like it or not, but you should like it because it's the only way it's going, is so diverse. I mean, my kids have, like, best mates of South American, German, French, as well as English and uh, Algerian. Yeah, that's what the world is like now. And mm. so they don't feel that they belong to one culture or another or they've got to compromise and think, right, I can only be this or I can only be that. No there's a whole new evolution going on right before us in society where you can take whatever suits you and be that thing. And that's how it should be. And so sick is like, is my reflection on what it is to be a modern kid where actually, yeah, you acknowledge that your influences are global and it's not a case of you limiting yourself to think, right, I'm only this thing or another. No, be mm. all of it, yeah? And, you know, there's yeah. all this brilliant stuff about gender identity. Yeah, there should well be. It's mm. not a case of thinking, you know, the challenges from my point of view is the toxic max masculinity, yeah? Mm. That male heroes are only of this type. Anything deviating yeah. from that is weak, yeah? And the flip yeah. side also being that to be a strong woman, you need to conform to the male hero stereotype, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, all of these barriers are really being broken down. It's an incredibly exciting time, especially in children's fiction, because these are where the identities are being forged. And when I was growing up, a long time ago, you were always felt you could either be muslim or you could be in british yeah yeah there was no such thing as a british asian identity at that point that came because we were children of immigrants yeah and mm. our parents harked back to the homeland in a way that was actually slightly old-fashioned because they had left pakistan or india or wherever and their perception of those countries became frozen in that time and so their idea of what it was to belong to that culture was fixed rather than realise everything is is completely evolving. And, yeah, um, I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to set the story in New York. I mean, I love New York. I've been there loads of times. Um, mm. But it's the ultimate immigrant city. The yeah. ultimate immigrant city. Yeah. Everyone yeah. from somewhere else. And so sick suits that city down to the ground because that city was built by people like him. His neighbour, you know, on one side is Italian, the other side is Chinese, but they're all New Yorkers. Yeah, in the same way, yeah. everyone defines them, you know, in many cases, we define ourselves as Londoners first and foremost. And mm. I think that's because it encompasses so much. And, um, yeah, so for me, writing about sick and the various aspects of his heritage was the most exciting thing about his character were actually all of it should be positive. There's no cultural clash with him. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, the idea that there's this whole clash of civilizations, East versus West is absolutely archaic and absolutely backward thinking. Mm. Ridiculous. And City of the Play God had to represent that forward movement. Yeah. And that's fascinating. And to, to hear that as well and, and, understand obviously that, that I have a not similar thing is obviously it's slightly different I am a gay woman and obviously stereotypes that do come with it and on television and in books is something that in my own writing I am trying to break down and change and not even write the romantic relationships that are included in a heterosexual light of like oh it's it's like to a man and a woman but it's just two women because that's not 
great that's not how it works so putting it in and not putting the agenda to it they just sometimes it's just that they happen to be two women who are in love or there is something alongside it exactly. and it's, yeah it's and it's part, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's part of the identity rather than the fundamental of the plot yeah exactly and that's something i always realize whenever i was reading books or seeing films that did feature two women who were falling in love every single one that i saw had that element of either they were going to be rejected by their family or they were hiding it from their family or they were embarrassed by who they are like i don't think i've ever seen one that didn't have that basis aspect of someone reacting badly which is really unfortunate that there aren't any films that at least i've seen that feature that or any stories and exactly. i'm glad to see that it's changing slightly in in recent years as well though I think that's what's interesting with just what's going on with the world now is just that not only is the world itself changing, but so is the information we're putting out. So fiction is changing so much. This year alone, um, going back to the, the stories of same-sex relationships outside of the angst, there are, I saw 20 different books coming out this year of just general love stories of two women falling in love all in different sort of things there was like a high school romance one there was like a fairy tale princess one and i was like all in a single year it's already changed and it's just it's amazing to see how different the world is becoming in just so such a short period of time as well and constantly evolving and to hear as well the reasoning behind the city of the play god and how that story is going to work as well with that coming out soon as well, it's just going to be another thing that kind of adds to that evolution of storytelling. So I'm very excited oh, to, to read it. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've seen it evolve within the 10 years that I've been published mm. because my first, right, my first character, my first two books featured a, a teen girl who's both half bugs and half English, but basically, you know, a Londoner. But my second series was about a British-born Asian boy going adventuring in India with Indian mythology. And this was before Rick Ryden put sense, etc. And we got turned down by so many publishers because they thought no one's mm -hmm. going to get this because it's a Asian writer writing about an Asian kid set in India. So it's a niche of a niche of a niche. And mm -hmm. I remember at that point thinking, hold on, I've been born and brought up in Britain, yeah. He's a yeah. British born nation, but it's that step by step disconnect that was really, at the time, it was really, really upsetting. We still mm. managed to get out. And what's brilliant is it's, let me think, came out 2011? Yeah, uh, coming up to 11 years and it's still in print. And what's really lovely is that this is where we go full circle. It was, that book, the Ash Mystery series, that brought me to Rick Ryder's attention in the first place. Oh. Because he was often being asked, when are you going to write about Indian mythology? And he says, no need, because Sarwat's already done it. And so me coming on board with Rick Ryder Presents feels as though it's a long time in coming. Yeah. Because, um, but yeah, and so for me to sort of see, wow, Rick Ryder Presents even exists, okay? Mm. But if we're going to be talking sort of, you know, if we're going to be talking shop, I think it needed something like Rick to be headlining it to mm. elevate the imprint to the level it needed to be for people to be, to take it seriously. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, the excess, the success of the imprint is a lot down to the fact that he's totally and utterly committed to it. And a lot of other writers were step by step. Well, that's somebody else's problem to be dealing with. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and also um, bringing a whole new bunch of writers to the wider readership. That if it had been, you know, published under any other circumstances, may well have just been pushed to the side as being a niche thing, rather than feeling yeah. that it's now mainstream. So yeah, even in the time that I've been published, the change. I mean, there are times when it swings backwards, and you're thinking, "Really, you're still doing this?" But there are, um, but things like the, this imprint is, and it feels like you belong to this like most tremendously exciting club. I've never had a chance to hang out with the cool kids, and so now <laughs> I see what I have. 
oh my gosh that's just that just sounds like a dream as well just i remember when um rick riordan presents was announced as well that all this was coming out i don't remember what years are a funny thing now i don't even i forget it's 2020 sometimes but when when the news came out that all these new writers were going to be brought in and they were going to be talking and showing different mythologies that they have experienced with that are representative of their cultures and they were going to get the boost of Rick's name as well. And but the fact that it wasn't even he he didn't even make it about himself, which I thought was oh. something that initially when I heard it, I was like, I know obviously that's not something that Rick would do because of how he has been with this. But there's always that instant of like, or oh, are they just gonna make like is the imprint gonna just make it all about Rick's involvement? Which was initial fear that I know lots of people had like is are they just gonna base it off of of Rick and not really give the stories the attention just of the writer who's written these stories themselves? But to see the engagement of the fans and the engagement of Rick of boosting every writer yeah. up in their own right was fantastic to see and the fact that it's continued as well and more people are coming into it and exactly. yeah and it's just it's just fascinating and just kind of from that as well just to sort of to move on to the question talking about rick riled and presents what is it for you and i know you've written uh, like you just mentioned a story in the past to do with indian mythology and mythology has been something you have engaged with it sounds like what is it about mythology and vent and adventure stories that draw you into that genre to write for that genre it's funny it seems like the most obvious question but i don't really think i have an art a, a straightforward answer for it i think part of it is probably attached to those are the stories that i read as a kid yeah mm. and so i always read mythology and adventure stories and so in a way perhaps that's my style of story thinking and then mm. of course me training even though i didn't realize at the time training to be a writer than writing dungeon dragons adventures so i think mm. there's a certain element of um the way my mind has settled yeah? yeah but also i mean there's the bigger thing right you know like take greek mythology yeah because it's the thing that people know best these stories are thousands of years old and they still haven't gone stale. There's something mm. really fundamental, you know, utterly, utterly human about them. They really, in, you know, in the same way that Shakespeare is not about a guy writing, you know, in the 1600s. It's about the human condition, right? Mm. And so with mythology and adventure, I think it's the human condition writ large. And so you can have more, f I say you can have more fun with it. You can have a different fun with it by going fantastical but at the end of the day if you don't care about the character it's it all becomes irrelevant it's all just uh spectacle and spectacle in itself is meaningless uh, but mythology i think allows you to explore re explore the life and death questions mm. and without giving too much away with City of the Plague God, one of the key factors is six older brother, Muhammad, who went back to Iraq after the war to help rebuild it. Um, mm. And sadly, he died. Now, he died out of the most mundane things. It was a car accident, right? Mm. But there is that longing that Sick has for the fact that he lost his brother and he never went on an adventure with him because yeah. he's much older and there's always the idea, oh, I'll go next year or, you know, going visiting Iraq is a bit difficult, a bit dangerous. I can't take my kid brother with him, yeah. And yeah. so there's that longing of this ultimate adventure that Sick never had, yeah. And by being able to explore fantastical mythological themes, I can bring that in in a way that I couldn't if I was going to go for a contemporary uh re real world setting um so what's great is you can make the fantastical real and so it just gives certainly for me it makes me feel of a far far uh bigger playground to play in and um i like the grand opera of mythology it's all just writ a bit larger and mm. so i think just like 
suit, yeah, suit my operatic um, urges, frankly. <laughs> if you're not a weeping or cheering towards the end of it, then I just don't feel that I've done my job. It's I can't write quiet. I think that's really what it boils down to. There's yeah. got to be a bit of um, bombastic music playing somewhere. Brilliant. And that that's definitely, I, I think even reading mythology, that's kind of what you get from it as well. There's like this this intense feeling that comes with something that is connected to mythology. Like, admittedly, I'd, I'd say reading like Homer, for example, obviously that's mythology, but that's that's a little bit different. But mainly because it's complicated to read. But there is that sense of like, you get the adventure and you, you feel involved with it as well, especially with these modern day mythologies that we are getting now obviously with um rick road and presents so there's definitely something about so i understand your feeling of of uh writing for mythology and venture as well and having that feeling and giving that to the readers also uh, i promise to let you know if your book makes me cry just send you like, <laughs> just send you a message like on twitter just like how dare you <laughs> but just in terms of writing as well like most people hear know that I I want to be a writer and I'm hoping one day to build up to that process and there are many maybe many people listening or watching who want to be writers as well or want to gain some advice so for the last two questions because we're, we're coming to the end now and this has been a blast all the same uh, to kind of start off with can you describe three aspects of writing craft that have been most important as you've developed as an author that you would recommend to others? Okay, right. First, I'm going to go through some of the obvious things really quickly, okay? okay. First of all is read not just what you love but other things, yeah? Mm. Because what ends up becoming your unique selling point is the way you amalgamate all your different influences. And it may seem that none of them should be connected, but because you filter them through yourself, there ends up being a, there ends up being a common theme. Mm. So read what you love, certainly, because that's probably what you're going to write. But what's going to make your work stand out is the other influences around it. Otherwise, it's just going to be a pastiche. And everyone's already read Lord of the Rings, yeah? So, uh, but what will be great is what you bring to it. Now, the other thing is that there's no, right, no shame in writing pastiches. I mean, my kid is madly into uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and Dragon Prince, right? Legend. Your uh, kid is a legend. You know, she start, you know, she's gone onto WhatsApp and reading all the fanfic, and I think, oh my gosh, if that had existed when I was around, I'd have like gone wall to wall with Conan and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> and in a way, that really, you know, we talk about adventure and mythological. So, you know, I'm still writing that style of thing. Yeah, brilliant training ground, right? And if you mm -hmm. can be sent, and if you can be sending it out to an audience through WhatsApp, or whether it's fanfic or whatever, oh, my gosh, that's amazing on several levels. First of all, you get a sense of where you're playing with regards mm. to everybody else and also being able to take the feedback, yeah? I think that's yeah. one of the most difficult things, even for us professional writers, when somebody tells us, that made no sense at all and I don't understand why any of it went in, yeah? So, if you, can, you know, if you can harden your shell towards that early on, yeah, so just write and get it out, right? And what will be what will happen is if you can still climb over the setbacks, you will become a published writer. It's as simple as that. It's always, you know, it's always about that fun of writing in its own, on its own, yeah, Where, mm. without having a necessary goal or ambition ahead of you. It's that you just like writing. And so if you're doing it because you feel that you want to become like a multimillionaire or wherever, oh, my gosh, just become a lawyer, all right? <laughs> or study math, go to a bank, okay? Then just <laughs> and load, retire by the time you're 30, then write whatever the hell you like, all right? So it's that just the love of writing a story. That's really what it boils down to. And if you can take the knockbacks and you carry on doing it, then you're going to get there. 
it's one of the things that when I first started to become, you know, wanted to become a writer, I had no plan about at what point in the future I expected to be published. I thought, well, I'll just have a go at writing a story and see if I can finish it. And I finished it. And at that point, I thought, yeah, JK Warning, watch your back, because here I come, right? I sent it to a bunch of, you know, I got the Writers and Artists Yearbook. I sent it to a bunch of agents, got wholeheartedly rejected. In fact, I think one rejection came within the date, within 24 hours of me sending it to them. And this was back in the day when there was post, right? I wasn't emailing it. Uh, but one of them came back with a few tips and that was just enough for me to think right i'm going to give another go and i wrote it the whole novel all over again from scratch because it was fun just doing it and then that got slightly less rejections and so and then you know i wrote it again from scratch right and so it's that sense of i just love writing that's really what it boils down to um mm. and you have that that thrill um then just go for it. But the fact is now you can send it out to an audience through, you know, social media or whatever. I think actually all, is all for the good. And, you know, there've been quite a lot of successes, you know, off the top of my head, Ready Player One, The Summoner, that have come out of WhatsApp or come out of like self-publishing. The audience is out there. There really, really is. But really write what you feel passionately about, but absorb as much as you can from loads and loads of different you know different genres different things that happen in your life because that that's going to make your writing unique and that's what the world really wants it's that uniqueness rather than here we go with the hobbits and the elves all over again brilliant uh, that that is really useful and definitely something i should probably improve on especially in broader broadening my reading horizons um for the final question for this for any budding writing out there, what would be the main advice you would offer to them? Right. Study the craft of writing. I'm just looking over my shoulder to see if I can find any of the writing books that I have used. Okay. Right. And you can see like there's a little kitten with a gun. So, <laughs> Uh, so what's fun, brilliant about this is that it goes through all the really obvious cliches of public um, of stories. And what's terrible is every now and then I flick through and think, oh, my gosh, I'm cliche number 49 in that book. I need to get back on to it, right? But there's another one that I cannot find, which is so annoying. Stephen King, you may have heard of him. He's quite oh, a yeah. well-known writer. He's written was both a biography and a writing guide called On Writing. Easy to remember. The first, so basically, there's a lot of stuff out there, right? Mm. Take your take the opportunity to learn the craft as you are writing the story, because there'll be things that there'll be traps you'll fall into because nobody's pointed out the particular simple rule to fix, right? Mm. And um and take your time actually right publishing is going to, um when i first got published everyone thought publishing was over everything was going to be ebooks and the books uh bookshops were were dead right no that's not happened it's ne in fact the one thing that's probably come out of this pandemic is the fact is people are reading much more than they've ever read. There's always going to be a need. Yeah. And the thing about physical books is they're little presents to yourself. Yeah. And we need things like that. Yeah. Who doesn't have a to be read part that only ever grows? So exactly. That's the joy <laughs> of it. That's the joy of it. So take your time, put in effort in learning the craft. Yeah, because there are easy wins there that will really help your writing along. But then, yeah, if you get, yeah, send it out to the world. Send it out to the world. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. All right, brilliant. That is, that, that is great. Thank you 
so much for coming to speak with me today and for giving insight to your story, for giving insight to your writing and this brilliant advice for anyone who does want to go on to being a writer themselves. So before we sign off, I want to give you the opportunity to let people know where they can find you, where they can support you, where they can pre-order the book. It's it's out for pre-order at the moment, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. which brings us back to the gaming thing. Right, okay. So, uh, oh, okay, here is a... That's oh. sort of what it's going to look like. I'm trying to focus it right. City okay. of the Playground comes out January. Uh, if you go on to my Twitter account, which is Sarwat Chadder, it's all fairly straightforward, um, look for the pinned tweet. Basically, I'm running a pre-order competition that for the first 200, there will be swag, but I'm going to pick names out of a hat and we're going to run an online game of Dungeons and Dragons as a prize. Mm. And I think that basically, and it's sort of acknowledging where it all sprung from. And yeah. a couple of, about two months ago, uh, I played my first online game with D&D and it was with, it was with Rick Ride and it was with Carlos, it was Kawami. It was basically the Rick Ryden Presents D&D group and it was hysterical fun. And Brilliant. Online gaming, I think, wow, why not? And so I shall be running a game of Dungeon Dragons for five winners out of the pre-order hat. So go on to my Twitter account, dig it up, and, yeah, join in the fun. It should be a laugh. All right, brilliant, guys. And those will be linked in the episode show notes or in the description box if you are here on YouTube. Um, so I put all your social media links as well um, and anything else that I can probably find. <laughs> and um, Hopefully people will go out and support you and go and pre-order City of the Plague God. So, Sawa, thank you so much for coming to speak My to pleasure. me today. Right. It has been brilliant and I've loved it. And I hope that the release of your book goes fabulously. Thank you very much, Fran. It's been a pleasure from my side as well. And I hope we get a chance to do this again. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm, I will be messaging you on Twitter soon enough, I'm sure. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, guys. Bye.